I, I think Eric hit on an important point. <clears throat> I could see where this doesn't become a recommendation for a PRS for a cardiovascular disease, but in this particular setting, like it always comes with, here's the score. Yes, the score is really associated with disease. Here are the characteristics. It calibrates well. Um, but then separately is, okay, now we're thinking about clinical utility. That's going to be very, like, for what? For screening, for treatment, right? So that would sort of be a, a pair which might be a little different from the rare disease. Um, and then I guess the things that come up for me as a challenge would be both calibration, um, which I think we've been lacking on as a field, but we're getting better at. Um, uh, uh, so Fume mentioned the Myriad score. I have no idea if they've calibrated that or in what population. Um, which only adds more confusion potentially for people who are trying to use this in the clinic. What does that number mean anyway? Should I trust it? Um, uh, and then like on the impl implementation end. So this is gonna be a list of six million beta hats, many of which are tiny. Like how do you like actually generate that number and hand it to somebody who wants to use it? Um, Naomi? I had a few points to make. So one is I think we are going to be behind. This is the 30-page report from 23andMe for type 2 diabetes, which is in an FDA format. So they're already um, you know, going to beat us all. Um, the second point I wanted to talk about was the cross-ancestry discussion. And uh, for me, it's been a bit confused because when we've got a polygenic risk score, we're talking about common variants which are shared across ancestries. And so you know, there's three issues. You know, are the causal variants the same? Are the allele frequencies the same? Are the effect sizes the same? And, and for me, it doesn't really make sense that the, if it's a causal variant in one ancestry, it isn't a causal variant in another. And so, re, you know, obviously, allele frequency effect sizes are going to change. Uh, and so we do need bigger studies for different ancestries. But the key thing is about linkage to equilibrium. That, that's what's breaking down. And so maybe Alicia can talk to this. It's, you know, one of the issues is about how big... How, how big should the reference samples be for imputation? Because at the moment, those reference samples aren't... Um, very big for those ancestries, and if we got bigger samples for imputation, then we'll get closer to the causal variants, and those polygenic risk predictors will get better uh, across ancestries. Elisa, do you want to comment? Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you that the causal effect sizes and like everything that we've looked at seem to be by and large shared. There are a few very small examples of heterogeneous effects, but I think you're totally right that the LD structure is vastly going to be driving those effect size estimate differences, not necessarily the causal differences. And so when we look at our samples, where about 80% of participants in GWAS are of European descent, but that's like 16% of the global population, we clearly have this mismatch in terms of what we're powered to actually translate to diverse populations, because as directly as you mentioned, these minor little frequency and LD differences and so I think to have any power to start to even those, we need like two major things. Um, first, we need statistical methods that can account for LD differences both within populations, but also across populations, which most current methods don't really do so well. Um, and then also, if we just have um, data coming from a biased source and we're trying to generalize that across, we're going to have decreasing power with increasing genetic divergence. Um, so I think we also need to like better data for more diverse populations. Where do we start is a good question. You could start from the most genetically diverged uh, source from where our representation is. So we would most rapidly close the gap if we studied African ancestry populations first and then started filling in the genetic divergence gap based on human history. But these are all really, really complex questions. Um, there's a whole lot of moving pieces there, as you mentioned, and it's not it's not a simple problem, so I don't think there's a simple solution. I think we need to come at this from a pretty uh, broad perspective. So yeah, really great points, I think. Great. Um, so we have Eric and then Mark. I'm going to disagree just so we have more discussion. And, <laughs> um, I, I, I think we have to keep in mind that the best predictor may not be the causal variance. We're trying to do prediction here, not mechanism or causation. So in, indeed, if the idea is to get a prediction score, and those predictors usually, the statistician tries to make them somewhat independent, the best predictor may not be the causal variant. So but, but trying to drive ourselves to a causal point. variant. That's the point, that with the, with the European ones, we're not, we haven't got the causal variants. We've right. got things in LD with them, and we're using that LD, and that's the whole issue with poly, you know, that's what we do in polygenic risk prediction. But if the LD has broken down between the causal variant and the other population, then, then the, it's about the LD, it's about getting the LD 
right, not necessarily about needing the large samples for, for specific diseases. But why yeah. not make a group-specific polygenic risk score based on because, sentinel variants? Well, that would be the ideal, but that's obviously very costly to get as large sample sizes in other ancestries. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with, with Eric. I think you have to go out and do the studies in the populations. I mean, look at APOE4, right? APOE4, we've known a long time, and it's got tons of heterogeneity in risk by sex and by ethnic group, and we still don't know what's going on, right? And that's one, you know, one locus. I'm not saying not do it. I just say that it's very expensive to get as large sam discovery sample sizes across ethnicities, and, and part of the way we can capture if our goal is prediction, is, is about thinking about the imputation to recover the LD. Okay, so we have Mark and then Nancy. Yeah, fortunately, all of us will solve that problem, so. Uh, <laughs> right, Josh? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is actually coming at this from the other direction, and it harkens back to a question that I think Muim was asking, and I think it goes to Eric. And that's the idea that our current risk scores, um, it, it, when we look at clinical factors, are clearly encompassing underlying genetics for at least a portion of those. And so in some ways, as we do the calculations incorporating genomic risk scores, we're double counting at least some things. And whether that makes a difference or not, I don't know. But uh, as we think about the analysis of these polygenic risk scores, um, is it desirable to try and identify um, genetic variants that seem to be independent of other known clinical risk scores, uh, and w would that be more likely to give us a pure uh, signal, and how would we go about constructing a study to do that? Um, mostly because of my mood, I'll just say, no, I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> um, and, and I really think it's because we have to remember often the, quote, covariate, let's say LDL cholesterol, just for fun, it was measured at a single point in time in a 50-year-old individual where the genotype, um, even though it may be operating largely through LDL, is capturing some lifelong process that's not captured in a single measurement at a single point in time of that covariate. So indeed, even though you've put LDL in the model, the genotype may have a major role of predicting disease. Um, and, and so I don't think it's necessary that we look for mechanisms outside the traditional risk factors, if, that, if, I'm, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Yeah, I think so, so although it raises an interesting question with electronic health records now about the use of longitudinal uh, clinical factors as opposed to the single measurements, which uh, I think we all recognize would probably be uh, beneficial, allowing for the effect, uh, effective treatment in that. But, you know, all of those sorts of things begin to um, uh, become, the complexity rapidly uh, uh, and exponentially increases to an infinity of things to consider. Correct. And I think tomorrow we're going to hear more from some over there about other omics measures that may indeed capture both genetic information, environmental information, and long, so particularly if you have them longitudinally, that would be will be even more predictor than the predictive than a single risk factor or the genotype. So we'll see. Okay, we have Nancy and then Carlos, and somebody's cell phone needs to be turned off. <laughs> yeah, well, so I, I just wanted to come back to a point that that was made about the importance of having all of the information on how the risk score is calculated. So, and I think the 23andMe one is particularly interesting because they didn't use published GWAS data, they use their own data with respect to the question, do you have type 2 diabetes? And I, you know, having been in the diabetes genetics game for a while, not everybody knows if they have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And, and to the extent they think they do, that information comes from their physician. And if you had any idea how many physicians in the United States think that if you take insulin, you're a type 1, and if you don't, you're a type 2. Um, that ought to scare everybody. Based on this information, I would be astonished if there weren't an HLA, a major HLA component to their type 2 diabetes prediction model just because there's, you know, some type 1 diabetics in there and HLA isn't. 800-pound gorilla. 
in a type one prediction. We have to know the details. To ask. We have to understand, okay, where did the diagnosis come from? Who made the diagnosis? Do we have any belief that, that, that we're getting information from the answer to the question, do you have type two diabetes? I, sometimes you do, but lots of times you don't. And I, so I, I'm, I, I think we have to really look at the data for these things too. Good point. Carlos. I, I'm curious if folks feel that a useful way of thinking about this is into management and care pathways. Um, because if, if we believe that heterogeneity of disease and heterogeneity of treatment are the norm, and if we're looking at, for example, large data sets of utilization and outcomes, um, then eventually what we want to do is figure out where folks are and how we can improve their health by putting them onto better treatment pathways. And the degree to which PRS allows us to identify folks and put them into the right pathway, then it's useful. Otherwise, it's, it's wonderful science, but probably not going to move the needle, right? That's why I think the high end of the tail is really useful. The low end of the tail, I don't think is, you know, you're, you're going to honestly reduce the use of, of in, in, in the United States. You know, maybe, maybe in Britain they'll delay the use of metformin or statins on folks. I don't, I don't see that happening in this country. And everyone, I think, should be reading on CRS and the work that Vandy's doing because of the conditional distribution that accumulates. You get more and more data, and you get these posterior distributions that move you into kind of clear paths. And so the degree to which this is a useful piece of information into putting you into that, then it's useful. The stuff that a tool butte is doing and others are doing into you know, you look at medication management for diabetes and they start on one drug and then you got to change them. Is that predictive and useful? Then, then yeah. If otherwise, then, you know, there's no delta there. So I would really encourage us to be thinking along that line because that's ultimately where you're going to have the impact. So, so let me argue with you a bit, Carlos, in terms of low-risk people. Um, so we've, we've seen in breast cancer, um, now this is somatic variant, et cetera, but we've seen in breast cancer, and Stephen can correct me now when I say something stupid, um, but, but there are, are women who are recommended not to get chemotherapy um, on the basis of the, their tumor process. Can't, couldn't that happen in, in looking at germline variants for other things? Couldn't it happen that you might not be recommended to be put on a statin, or you might not be recommended to get your mammograms every year? Or, or that sort of thing based on the low end of the risk score. And I, I guess I wouldn't discount that, but now Stephen's going to tell me I'm all wet. I mean, I'm certainly very interested in protective alleles, particularly if they're going to lead us down cool, you know, PCSK9 inhibitors I'm all about, right? But no, I'm, I think talking that's about changing, I'm talking about changing clinical care yeah. um, where, where you have an average recommendation and, and you know, some it, people... It would be really interesting to see. I, I, my, my sense is that I think people are going to be really reticent to, to do that. Um, Maybe. Particularly because of the the the, the, the risk, but I, I I'm not an expert at, at all okay. on this. It's just so my if, intuition. So if we can hear hear from one. So Stephen, did you did you want to comment on that, and then we'll go to Iftikhar, and then Peter. Did you have a? I'm coming midstream, so I'm. Oh, uh, you need to press. Okay, we you didn't get the AV training. You have to press the thing. It needs to oh, turn it's blue. blue. It's, it's blue. We're we're in Maryland. No, it's all right. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> it's very important. It'll get political at about five o'clock with Zach later today, um, I, but I I think you know the, the the question again with with cancer where we are is the difference between public health and individual recommendations, correct? Uh, when we're looking at germline, but when you go to the tumor, it's all about the individual. You know there are scores of FDA approved agents that are in the pipeline right now for very specific mutations that. Uh, are, are indeed treatable and, and some of them have mapping back to them now germline aspects so PARP inhibitors now you know look like you can look at a tumor signature and see that somebody may have a BRCA mutation or may not have something in that HRD pathway that they will have a positive effect in being treated by that and so you know we have surrogates in the somatic that are telling us that there are aspects in the germline that are crucial and whether they're highly penetrant mutations or actually PRSs. If you look at PRSs in breast cancer, you can see higher or lower mutational burdens in 
inverse proportion. So the, you know, the age of using this in cancer really brings up these classic questions of what do you do in the individual and what do you do in the uh, you know, risk stratification. And I know Monsi will talk about this for breast cancer in a much more elegant and much more interesting ways, but um, it's upon us. I mean, we, we can't well, reverse it. And, and I think we also should consider that, that the cancer field, much to my chagrin, has been far ahead of the rest of genomics um, for the past many, many years. And so, so can, we, can we sort of see where that field is going um, and, and maybe follow on? Uh, nah. Nah, it'll never happen. Um, so we have, if, uh, sorry, we had Mark Iftikhar Fumi. Yeah, I just wanted to um, um, tell you about a study that we had done using the Utah Population Database to try and address that question. Uh, what we did was we did really deep uh, family history of, uh, since there's a, uh, the Utah Population Database essentially is a large constructed pedigree of Utah families that's tied to electronic health records. And so what we did is we looked out to three generations of family history for colorectal cancer and asked the question, um, not only if, uh, depending on the number of relatives that you had that had colorectal cancer, what was the increase in risk, but we said if we go out three generations and we find no one with colorectal cancer, what is the protective effect of that? And what we found was that individuals that had no evidence of colorectal cancer and relatives out to three generations, their relative risk was about 0.8. So it was a modest decrease, but probably not enough to really take you out of that population screening uh, paradigm. Now, we're doing some modeling work using the MISCAN colorectal uh, cancer um, uh, model um, that uh, we uh, are, have a manuscript that's been submitted, looking at polygenic risk scores um, to say, can you stratify and use different strategies for screening periodicity and age of onset of screening? that shows some interesting um, things. I think the bigger driver, though, will have nothing to do with the science. As we uh, re learned from the USPSTF recommendations around um, uh, mammography, which is there's going to be a social consequence of, of screening, and I could have used PSA as an equally uh, relevant example as we look at what the uro urologist did in response to that, uh, to say that no matter how solid we are in the science, there are going to be uh, uh, social and economic factors that are probably going to be much more, uh, much larger drivers of behavior than what we tell folks. Yeah, as, as has always been. been. As be. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, Iftikhar? Yes, thanks. So, many of the concepts that were discussed today were actually encountered and addressed in the clinical trial we did, the MyGene study, where we uh, selected 200 individuals with intermediate risk of CHD and then randomized them to getting a genetic risk score versus just a conventional risk score. And what we found was that in those individuals that got the genetic risk score plus the conventional risk score, there was a change in outcome at six months in that the LDL low levels were lower in those with uh, the high genetic risk score. Now, you could say that if there were the low genetic risk individual, that should have offset whatever it was and that the LDL level shouldn't have changed. But to Carlos's point, I think it's very difficult for physicians to come to terms with downgrading risk. They're much more comfortable upgrading risk. And if you tell a patient that your Framingham risk is 10, but your genetic risk score says that it should now be six, physicians and patients have a difficulty with that. On the other hand, in that trial, actually, and this is not me speculating, this is what we found, when their risk went up uh, with the genetic risk score from 10 to 15, it was much easier to make a decision, and it was a shared decision to start a statin. And so what happened in that trial was that at the end of the six months, the people with the high genetic risk score got put on a statin and their LDL got down, but the same actions of withdrawal of medication wasn't there in the low risk, so that's why we found the difference. So I think that um, many of the, discu the discussion points that were raised were actually uh, addressed, and if there's time, I'll describe more of that study, but I should point out that it was a genomic medicine implementation study that we did as part of Emerge Phase Two. That if, if all we did with PRS scores, get people who are at high risk to take their statins, that would be a massive win, right? That, that would be a huge Agreed. delta. Thank you. Fumi. Yeah. So, well, I'm glad that uh, Steve is here now. I think the real issue with um, cancer as a complex disease and how cancer has sort of been far ahead is really because there's been 
as uh, people have been able to take risks and communicate risk to patients, and, and we, over 20 years, have found that people actually act on that communication of risk. And so I think the, the question for us in, in cancer is not that we cannot communicate risk, it's that we don't want to harm patients. And patients are harmed when we give them unnecessary treatments. And so the way we see PRS actually coming to breast cancer, for example, is we have had so much unnecessary biopsies, diagnosis, because everyone went to get mammograms that actually didn't prevent or reduce the risk of aggressive breast cancer. The same thing with prostate cancer. People went and did PSA screening, and they still had people coming in with advanced metastatic prostate cancer. So PRS, if it can be integrated with phenotypes, and that's why the heterogeneity is important for us in cancer, because we don't care to find a prostate cancer that's not going to kill you, even if it stays there till 90. But we do care to find that prostate cancer that's going to kill you at 55. And that's why everyone in oncology is really accepting the fact that there's heterogeneity and that we're going to use it for better risk stratification. Point. Uh, so we have Greg and then Dan. Uh, so I want to also address the low versus high end um, comment. So I had a, a commentary in Nature Reviews Genetics in January called Going to the Negative, arguing that we should be using PRS uh, to identify people at the low end, and then a, a follow-up in PLOS Genetics this month, uh, reviewing five cases much more carefully. And the argument is that, uh, so I agree with you that it's unlikely to happen in America, but if 100 million Americans are taking either a statin or a beta blocker, f cost $50 a year, that's $50 billion over a 10-year period. And it turns out to be something like $200,000 per event saved, which you, know, you can ask what, what the benefits of that are. But, but if you reduce that number by 20%, that's a lot of money saved. And it may not matter in the American setting, but it does matter in developing countries enormously. So the savings for, for, for say, India or places like that, we have, where those healthcare costs are, are enormous, um, I think are, are, are big. And then the other point is that um, when you deal, it depends on the setting as well. So if you're thinking of Crohn's disease or, or migraine or, or other places where people are going to be spending between ten dollars and $50,000 on biologic therapies, you can have 10% of Americans on biologics in the next 10 years' time, costing $10,000 to $50,000 a year, who's paying that? And my argument is that we can use the negative end, the low end, to identify who, who really probably shouldn't, is not high priority for those, and make considerable savings there, and in fact, medical savings as well, potentially. Um, and that's not to say that we shouldn't be using PRS for the, for the positive end as well. I think it's, it's a balance, but we've kind of ignored the, the low end at our peril, I think. Thank you. Dan. So I just wanted to uh, insert sort of a, a digression into this discussion, and that was a, a, a side conversation I had with Eric at the, at the break, and that is the, um, that is the, uh, uh, the idea that polygenic risk scores can be a marker for penetrance in monogenic diseases. So, uh, and, and that is, I, I think, something that, you know, those are, those are rarer, but it highlights the idea. In, in the, uh, you know, in the cardiovascular arrhythmia space, in the cardiomyopathy space, in the cancer space, between rare variants that are highly penetrant in general, but often not 100%, and very, very common diseases like the ones we've been discussing today. So I, I want us not to lose track of the fact that, for example, when I go to clinic and see somebody with, or see a family with long QT syndrome, some of those have the phenotype, some of them don't. And I, and I think in my heart of hearts, the, phenot the, the polygenic risk scores are going to be an answer to that. And that is, that is, I think, easily actionable, a smaller population, maybe not so small, though. So uh, just for the record. Thank you. Uh, so we have Howard, then Peter, then Mark. So Terry mentioned the, the uh, breast cancer test, it was the Oncotype DX test in particular, that uh, was able to show who should not be treated for breast cancer in terms of chemotherapy, in addition to who needs to be treated. And the reason why that's been uh, reluctantly adopted is because the, the studies were done to show that there was no benefit in treating those patients uh, on the low end 
and that there was benefit on treating those patients in the high end to the point where, and, and there was clarity for the intermediates, which was their risk, and to the point where insurance companies adopt it, uh, clinical guidelines adopt it. You know, there was data that drove it. So I think the, the argument that we can't go negative even in the U.S., or especially in the U.S., is really going to be, is there, is there data to say that there's something that one can do that is worthwhile? And so I think it's imperative that we do those studies. And that was a very expensive study that lasted 10 years. But those 10 years went pretty fast, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, we now have the data. So uh, I, I think it's, it's really back to, if it's important enough, let's do the studies and, and uh, then act accordingly. Mark. Uh, no, Peter, I'm sorry. Peter was next. Peter. Thanks. Um, so uh, just really quickly to build on Harold and Dan's comments. Um, so uh, I, I, I agree that one of the potential use cases for PRS is differentiating risk among folks who carry high penetrance mutations. And we're already seeing some preliminary evidence for this in breast cancer management where you, somebody has an intermediate penetrance variant. Um, it's not exactly obvious what the clinical um, uh, uh, intervention should be. Uh, if you are lucky enough to have a low PRS, we might recommend that, in fact, uh, you know, get screened maybe more often or just, you know, we treat you like the, uh, a normal person, avo avoiding overdiagnosis. On the other hand, if you're at the high risk end, then we would take something, we, we would intervene a little more drastically. So there's gray areas where I think this will contribute. And just to, to um, Howard's point, um, uh, yeah, I think this is, you know, whether it makes sense or not to, to identify folks who are at low risk um, will sort of depend on what the, what the evidence is telling us. And then in terms of, you know, if there's going to be pushback just because it seemed like you're taking something away from me or there's strong uh, financial incentives to, to give a particular term, those things, those things change over time. Like the definition of electability has changed over time. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I think that'll change. And then just really quick on the double counting question that came up earlier. Um, so I, I like Eric's point that um, even if the genotype is acting, some of the genotypes, not all, are acting through a known risk factor, our measurements of those are not the greatest. And even as we get better for them, that's always an empirical thing. Like we can, we can put both of them in the model and we can see how well we do with both. Uh, and if at some point some of the genetics get kicked out, once you have those in, well, so be it. Um, Great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so I want to come back to the point that Greg made uh, about, um, you know, the, the uh, individuals that are getting really expensive therapies, because I think that's, uh, that's really important. Um, the question uh, that derives from that that might be of relevance to, you know, something that would come out of this meeting would, what, what types of studies would be needed to identify the individuals within a population that would be eligible to take a, uh, uh, an expensive drug uh, to uh, identify them as being low risk and uh, for progression and therefore not needing it. Now, some of it is just going to be simple demographics, which is the idea, well, this progresses over 10 years, your expect life expectancy is two for other reasons, so we don't really need to invest that. We don't do a great job, in, at least in this country, about that type of decision making. But if we set that aside, uh, I would posit that the types of studies that we're talking about for polygenic risk scores right now are going to have to be modified to be able to address that particular question. Because it's not always going to be polygenic risk either. I mean, the example that we published was um, with a large population of individuals with fatty liver, we were able to see that about 20% of them didn't progress to um, inflammation and fibrosis. And as we looked at them, we found that these individuals, by an experiment of nature, were null for a given enzyme um, that seems to be critical in terms of that inflammatory pathway. Well, that provides an opportunity for a target for a drug, but you certainly don't want to be giving that drug to the people that are already null. Uh, for, for that. But that's a monogenic as opposed to polygenic, but presumably there would be some ways to do it. So that would be the question I would have uh, that probably we can't answer today, but could be of, of a scientific interest down the road, which is how would we design those types of studies? Okay. Just to answer your question, Mark. Oh, you can't answer Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a, well, there's a classic, these, these are what we normally would call these companion diagnostics, right? So when can PRS be a companion diagnostic to justify the premium pricing, right? So the BRCA bowl of PRS, right, that would go along with 
say, PCSK9 or other biologics. And, and if you hate, Greg, the $10,000 biologics, wait for the curative therapies that are half a million to a million dollars a year, uh, th those will really break the bank. But, you know, uh, and, they're, and they are coming. So I, I do think it is the, the pointy end of the stick. Great. So we have Stephen and Eric and then um, um, Patrick. Okay, I just I wanted to throw out a controversial point, and that is I'm not sure there's any such thing as a monogenic disorder anymore. Uh, and I, I think all disor disorders are complex, and the underlying genetic architecture is part of the picture. As Joe Fromini used to say years ago, the disease, at least cancer, is 100% genetic and 100% environmental. Uh, in that your genetics set your carburetor for how you would either respond or not respond. But I think, you know, it, it's important, I think, to be, to be thinking about where we're going as a field and not separating, you know, quote unquote, complex diseases from Mendelian disorders. But I also wanted to come to a, another point, and that is, and Mary will know all too well, pediatric oncology and ALL, for instance, we've had on the table for 15 to 20 years this idea that some kids are over-treated and we haven't figured out how to do the studies and convince our colleagues to back off on the treatment. I mean, we have more survivorship issues than we necessarily need in pediatric ALL. Now, there are a lot of very exciting things going on that are in research but are still probably years away from being able to better discriminate how and in what way to treat the most common form of pediatric cancer. But the pediatric oncology community is not really willing to step back. I mean, a few research institutions are looking at this, but if you go to the general population, and this is not about genetics, this is just about this question of getting success to a certain point and not risking any step backwards. It's a very, very difficult sociologic thing that the medical profession, I think, is one of the major blocks towards that kind of change. I don't know, Mary, you may want to comment or... <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. It might be genetic, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so people keep understudying low-risk ALL, right? You don't know what defines low versus high risk unless you study them all. So we have Eric, Patrick, David, and Bob. So my question it actually captures the last four, and I'll put it to Howard just for fun. Um, you know, you talked about the trial and the evidence that was changing breast cancer therapy. And I assume it was a trial, by the way, because that's really my question. Do we have to, it has to do with what's the evidence for clinical decision support? Is this field going to have to be driven by old-fashioned, randomized clinical trials? Or do you think we can change practice by getting enough large healthcare practices to put the data in place that we can develop observational information that the field will find compelling? We do? Okay. So we're with uh, Patrick and then Dave, I think. Or is it Dave and then Patrick? I think Patrick's yeah. first. Couple of uh, couple of follow-up points. I think Carlos raised it about guidelines down the line. I mean, I have sat on guideline committees for a number of years, and I, I don't think there'd be any hesitation to use polygenic risk scores in guidelines. I think that you just have to show, just like anything else in a guideline, is that you actually are changing that they'll ultimately change clinical care. That they're actionable points. I mean, there are a lot of things in guidelines that are pretty empiric um, and are summation of you know, consensus thought in the field, but you, you really need actionable data. I mean, the appeal of it is that a genotyping array can be done once for many, many different diseases. So even if you miss for coronary disease, you have a hit for Alzheimer's, it's still quite cost effective. And I think overall, the other point is, um, I think it has to be easy to use. You know, I, I go back to, this is a great discussion, and I go back to my dinner table conversations. My wife's a primary care doctor, and, you know, we were involved in Ahmet's uh, uh, study, and I told her about it, and there's this really neat stratification you can do, and her eyes start to glaze over, and it's like, great, one more thing I have to deal with with my patients. Um, you know, unless it's, there's going to be a little box that's in your electronic health record that shows up that says, here's, uh, here's your polygenic risk for disease X, unless it's that simple, and it integrates any other clinical and, uh, data that's necessary, um, it's not going to be something that's going to be broadly uh, usable in, in that kind of 15-minute visit in the primary care setting. Yeah. Um, Good point. Uh, David? 
So I just wanted to comment on a number, number of uh, points made by others. First of all, uh, to Stephen's last remark, um, although we routinely talk about genetic disease, there are two things I tell the medical students. All disease has both a genetic and an environmental component and uh, that both what we currently call Mendelian disease and what we call complex traits are both complex um, and both are influenced by the environment. So I agree heartily with what you said. Um, the, in terms of what Dan said, in terms of the PRS being used uh, to think about penetrance of rare Mendelian disorders, I think that's a great idea. We've learned from the Mendel projects that there are a lot of other things that explain penetrance in some cases. So I don't think it's going to be the cure-all for, for explaining uh, incomplete penetrance uh, or more likely variable expressivity. Uh, but I think it might be an important variable to look at, particularly in those diseases in which one or a few alleles um, are, make up a large fraction of the patients. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks. No, I have I, one oh. other point to Patrick. <laughs> uh, uh, the question about a box with your PRS score in it. So the, there ought to be another box about what to do about it. A question. So we have Bob and then Fumi. Uh, so on, in the discussion about the, the negative side, um, I think a lot of it depends on what the outcome measure is. Uh, in rural America, there's a vast deficiency of primary care providers. So I would argue that any primary care provider that's um, spending their time managing risk that isn't there uh, is a primary care provider that's not managing um, a more important patient uh, condition. Excellent point. Uh, Fumi? Yeah, so I just want to come back to sort of communication of risk and, and genetics. I think we lose you know, our constituents when we make it very complicated. I think you know, everyone goes to their primary care provider or even now, their nurses in genetics and their advanced practice mid-levels that understand that cancer is a genetic disease. We try to talk about germline versus somatic, but once you say there's something wrong with the gene and we can target it, people are signing up to get their tumor tested and to get their blood tested because they want cures. And that's why we've been able to advance risk prediction and modeling for breast cancer. And I think that it took us 20 years for everybody else to actually come on board. But women came on board because they actually really wanted a future where we could predict risk for their daughters. That's sort of what the early studies in terms of implementation of BRCA testing in the clinic showed. And I think now there's an opportunity for us to simplify what we bring to the clinic. So I would hope that with PRS score, because part of the challenge was that, well, it's only a fraction of breast cancers that are due to BRCA. So let's not worry about that, because most of it is environmental and lifestyle. But I think we can have a unifying theme now about genetics can help us with risk stratification, because we actually have interventions that work now. And the question is, how do we communicate that? So there are two things that people don't believe in the population. It's genetics and it's vaccines. And it's because we don't communicate the risk appropriately. So if there's anything we can do to improve how we communicate risk to the lay public, then we should study it and then think about the interventions that we could use PRS for. Great. Thank you. Naomi. Um, I just thought I'd share some of the ways that we've been thinking about taking polygenic risk scores forward. So um, we've been thinking that the best way to implement would be in situations where we already have a known screening strategy. So for example, colorectal cancer with the fecal test, glaucoma where you know we know the guidelines but many people don't go to the ophthalmologist, well, at least in our situation. And so, you know, because if you want to evaluate polygenic risk in a prevention setting, it's going to take a long time to, to evaluate. So these are settings where the evaluation would be, do people actually go forward and take the screening, which they don't otherwise take? And the other thing that we were thinking is that um, to take a close, keep a close eye on pharmacogenomic risk, because 
if pharmacogenomic risk predictors um, are implemented uh, or seen to be valuable, then you'll suddenly have a situation where people do already have genotypes available online, and that's when um, yeah, someone was asking about the black box. It would be very easy to have uh, genotypes sitting, and you just, you know, when you order a test, the test is about the, the new algorithm that's applied to the existing genotypes, and it could just be a press of a button on a GP's laptop. Great. Thank you. All right. I think we'll have to close this session now. Um, Dan, are you ready to totally. take on the next one?